Today's event is jointly hosted by ISR Survey Research Center and is also co-sponsored by two of the Ford School's research centers, the Education Policy Initiative and the Center for Public Policy in Diverse Societies. And I'd like to thank those teams for working together and to uh, actively bring today's uh, roundtable um, together, especially Robin Jacob and Ryan Jacob, Robin at ISR, and Ryan, of course, who's a member of the Ford School faculty, who will be helping to moderate the panel. Well, as you may know, today's event um, is part of the university's 28th annual celebration of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. What you may not know is that the theme for today's, or for this year's uh, symposium, is Power, Justice, and Love Heal the Divide. And I have to say that as I reflected on that theme, it seemed to me that the topic for our panel today causes of and potential solutions to educational disparity, that topic is squarely at the forefront of the challenges that we face in terms of healing the divide that confronts our nation. Educational disparities are linked to geographic, socioeconomic, and racial inequalities, and they really are grounded in the history of our nation and in very foundational ways. And recognizing that we have a long way to go to realize Dr. King's goals of freedom, justice, and equality really requires us to think through, to recognize, and to address the critical challenges and disparities in our educational systems. So I look forward to both hearing and then discussing uh, in the, the second part of our panel the insights and solutions that Stephanie Kerwin and Angel proposed to us this afternoon. Uh, before our participants begin, it is my pleasure to introduce Bill Axon. In addition to directing ISR Survey Research Center, he's Professor of Sociology and Research Professor at the Population Studies Center. And his research focuses on a wide range of issues related to social change, family organization, um, intergenerational relationships in the United States and in Nepal. And with that very disparate uh, set of perspectives, I'm delighted to welcome him to the podium. Thank you so much, Susan. That was, uh, that was lovely. Uh, the Survey Research Center at the Institute for Social Research is pleased to be co-hosting this roundtable, the second of our two MLK Day events focused on the issue of educational disparities in the United States. The Institute has a long history of collecting <coughs> high-quality social science research on education, uh, on, on, on social science research in the public interest, and especially education. The Survey Research Center launched a few years ago its program in educational well-being. It's led by Brian Rowan and Robin Jacob. And it is a, a, the core element of our commitment to studying education and launching this kind of work on education. The education of children plays a vital role in ensuring the long-term prosperity of our society. But it's an area where we as a nation continue to struggle. Thus, we thought it was fitting that this year's MLK Symposium focus on the issue of education disparities. Last week, we presented a play about the struggles of a first-year teacher in the Chicago Public Schools. The play underscored the marked disparities that exist in our educational system, particularly in urban schools. We hope our program today can help us explore more deeply the causes, consequences, and potential solutions to those disparities. I'm now going to turn things over to Robin and Brian Jacob, our co-organizers of this event, who will introduce our speakers. Robin Jacob is a research assistant professor in, ed in the Education Wellbeing Program at the Survey Research Center and at the School of Education. Brian Jacob is the Walter H. Annenberg Professor of Education Policy, Professor of Economics, and Professor of Education at the Ford School of Public Policy. Please help me welcome Robin and Brian. When Brian and I began organizing this panel, we set out to find a preeminent economist, uh, sociologist, and psychologist to offer perspectives on the issue of educational disparities in the US. We wanted a group of people who were well-respected in their own disciplines, who could provide insightful perspective on the issue, who could speak across disciplines, and who would appeal to a wider audience. Stephanie, Angel, and Kerwin more than meet all these criteria, and we're thrilled to have them here. 
Um, but we were also really pleasantly surprised to discover that they all have something else in common, which is that they all have a current or former affiliation with the University of Michigan. Um, and in retrospect, this shouldn't have been a surprise. It simply underscores the excellence of this great university. So uh, the way we're going to proceed now is um, I'm going to do a brief introduction, uh, formal introduction to the speakers. They'll each speak for about 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, I'd like to remind the audience that if you have a question for our speakers, please write it down on one of the cards passed out at the entrance. So Ford School volunteers will be collecting cards at around 4.40 p.m. If you're watching online, <coughs> please submit your questions via Twitter uh, using the hashtag EdDisparities. Um, and so uh, just going in alphabetical order, uh, Kerwin Charles is the Edwin and Betty L. Bergman Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. His research focuses on a range of subjects in the broad area of applied microeconomics. Um, he studied uh, issues such as the effect of racial composition of neighborhoods on the social connections people make, uh, differences in visible consumption across uh, racial and ethnic groups, um, and in recent work has studied the, the degree to which prejudice can account for wage, for wage and employment differences by race and gender. Um, also, as many of you know, uh, Kerwin is a former uh, faculty member at the Ford School, the Econ Department, and ISR, so he's a, a perfect uh, fit for the uh, round table here. Um, uh, next, uh, Angel Harris is a professor of sociology and African American studies at Duke University and co-director of the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic Identity. Um, his research interests include social inequality, uh, policy, and education. His work focuses on a wide variety of social psychological determinants of the racial achievement gap um, and factors that contribute to differences in academic investment among African American, Latino, and white youth. Um, and as Susan mentioned before, he is a uh, a distinguished graduate of the uh, doctoral program in sociology and public policy here at Michigan. Um, and we're very pleased to have him back with us. And last but not least, Stephanie Rowley is a professor at, uh, at the University of Michigan School of Education and the Department of Psychology. Uh, she is a psychologist with a PhD in developmental psychology from the University of Virginia. And her work looks at the uh, development of achievement motivation uh, and how that differs across race and gender. Um, she's recently uh, started a project looking at the predictors of parent socialization and the effect that that socialization has on the outcomes of children, how this varies across race and gender. So we are uh, delighted to have all of our speakers here today. Without further ado, I am going to invite out uh, Angel Harris, who is going first because he was uh, bold enough to have PowerPoint slides. So uh, please. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, um, I'm honored to be here, and I hope that I uh, have some interesting things to say. Uh, this is a perspective from one sociologist. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is how I think part of the problem is that there's not enough respect for the problem. Also that I think we're spinning our wheels when it comes to explanations for educational disparities. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about where I think we should focus. So I'm not going to really present uh, any research. Um, so what is the achievement gap? How big is the achievement gap? Well, what I'm showing you here is achievement for blacks, whites, and uh, Hispanics in the 12th grade. So this is based on National Assessment of Educational Progress. So this is nationally representative data, OK, 12th graders. Uh, the 300, each test is scaled so the 300 is considered proficient. So you see that white uh, 12th graders are closer to being proficient than black and Hispanic 12th graders. But in order to give you a sense for the gap, I'm going to put up a red line. And the red line represents white 8th graders. So this is four years worth of growth. But the other thing you'll notice here is that on average, uh, white 8th graders are, um, actually black and Latino 12th graders are graduating high school with skill sets equivalent to whites in the 8th grade. So it's a four year gap on average. This is a different way of showing you the achievement gap. This is based on uh, NAEP data, again, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. So this is nationally representative data. And here you're looking at the students at or above basic proficiency level. And I'm going to highlight the bar for blacks. 
where you see slightly more than half of blacks are proficient in reading and less than a third are proficient in math, science, and U.S. history. Hispanics are not doing too much better. Now, this is the gap over time, okay? So here you're seeing uh, every decade the U.S. Department of Education collects large-scale data sets, and this what allows researchers to conduct uh, studies on education. And so I'm showing you the standardized gap for the Equal Education Opportunity of 1965, National Longitudinal Study of 72, High School and Beyond of 80 and 82, and the National Education Longitudinal Study of 1992, and the Education Longitudinal Survey of 2006. So these are all 12th graders in those years. And so because you're going across decades and across you know, different tests, different samples, the, the gap was standardized. And so you're seeing how the gap changes over time. Well, Hedges and Newell conducted a study in which they calculated that the gap at the rate of decline from 65 to 92, the gap was closing by 0.12 standard deviations per decade. So in other words, uh, how, many how many times do you have to subtract this number from that number to get to zero? Is that's how many decades it's going to take to close the gap. So roughly five to six decades to close the gap, given the rate of decline from 65 to 92, absent any major intervention. Here's the same information for math. 12th graders, again, the rate of decline is 0 0.08 standard deviations. So what you're seeing is that it's going to take roughly 10 decades for the gap to close in math. Absent intervention. And that's given the rate of decline from 1965 to 1992. So those projections are good up to 92. What has happened since 1992? What's happened since the mid-90s? Here I'm showing you the gap on perhaps the most consequential of exams, the SAT, 96 through 2012. Uh, the scores are not important. What's important is that the lines are not converging. And so that convergence from 65 to 92 has stalled. And so now we see that the gap is pretty much, you know, it's flat. And that's reading, and there's math. So essentially what, what I've shown you so far is that uh, it's a four-year gap. It's pretty big. And on average, black and Hispanic 12th graders are graduating with eighth grade <laughs> skill set. It's pervasive. It spans across a wide range of subjects, reading, science, math, U.S. history. You can't just focus on one particular subject. It's persistent. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And given these, these, this, this trend, um, we haven't even begun to cut into those projected declines yet. So I would still say that those projections are probably still accurate in terms of five decades in reading and close to 10 decades in math, absent any major intervention. Um, some news that I thought was good at one point was that these lines, so this is 2012, somewhere toward the end of this right here is 2014, and these lines were going to drastically converge by 2014. And the reason why is because the No Child Left Behind Act suggested that this was the year for the gap to close. <laughs> and so when they suggested that, I thought that they were aware of these patterns, but that there was some magic plan that they were going to unveil <laughs> that was going to lead the, the, these lines to converge drastically in one year. Um, it, it, it just makes you think about, um, when people think about policies, are they realistic? Are they aware of the data? Are they connected to the data and the trends and the patterns? So I've talked about the gap in terms of test scores. Well, here's the gap in terms of GPA. What I'm showing you is the average GPA for students in uh, 2001 was 330. So this zero represents 330 in 2001. And whites were this much more than the national average. So they're 336. Right? So this is showing you how much more they are above the average in 2001 and in 2011. That's whites. It's Asian Americans, there's Hispanics and blacks. So it's a gap that shows up on standardized tests. It's a gap that shows up on GPA, teacher evaluations. So it's a, it's a, it's a real problem. Now, why is this perhaps, I think, the biggest problem facing this country this century? Here you're looking at the U.S. population percentage white and non-white in 2000, 2010, and from here on we have projections. Regardless of whether you believe the projections, uh, it's certainly clear that the country is rapidly diversifying. You cannot have nearly half of your population walking around with eighth grade skill sets on average. 
there's no way that doesn't affect everyone. And so this is why I think this is a big problem. And I think that when you hear politicians or superintendents say that, you know, I'm going to close the gap in my term in office. You know, this is going to be closed, you know, within the next three to four years. They don't respect the problem. Um, it's like uh, trying to um, uh, stop a freight train with a BB gun. Uh, you know, you don't walk into the office of an oncologist. This is the example I like to use. You don't walk into the office of an oncologist and say, you guys have been working on cancer research for decades. Millions of dollars have gone into this. I want the cure by next week. We don't say that because we respect that problem. And so this problem warrants that same level of respect when you realize the depth of it. So part of the problem is that we do have a lack of respect, and people actually believe that they're going to solve it within you know, the next five to 10 years. Uh, the other thing is that I think we're spinning our wheels. So one is that there are tons of explanations that have been put forward for the gap. I'm going to talk about a few of the popular ones. One you have is genetic deficiency. This was put forward by Arthur Jensen, a uh, psychologist, and uh, Hernstein and Murray uh, revived it with the publication of The Bell-Shaped Curve. And this is, um, there really is not much empirical evidence to support this, although there are uh, some researchers at UNC Chapel Hill who have um, uh, been doing some work on uh, the role of genetics in predicting social behaviors. Uh, they've, uh, 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 they've, there's a data set called Ad Health that has uh, a thousand variables, uh, um, and each variable corresponds to a particular gene, and it's measured as zero, one, two, the presence, the absence of a gene, the presence, and or the you know the presence for sure of the gene, uh, and uh, it's only a matter of time before I think that it starts to get linked to achievement. Um, it's a clumsy way of, it's, it's what happens when social scientists try to play geneticists. Uh, but nevertheless, I like to think that it's not taken seriously anymore, but I, I can't really say that knowing that there are some scholars out there that are still kind of thinking in this direction. The next thing is that there are differences in school resources, in um, family structure or uh, uh, family socioeconomic status. And this explanation is, is one that, you know, you've, we've all heard various uh, uh, um, variations of this. Uh, the gap still exists when you control for uh, socioeconomic background factors. What that means is, uh, to give a brief, really, really quick, uh, uh, what I mean by control for, is uh, when you equalize on characteristics, um, uh, th that's what you're controlling. So an example I give, because I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to, uh, I, I'm a friendly quantitative researcher. So um, oftentimes, let's say you have a, a, an achievement gap in this room, and women are outperform, uh, outperforming the males, let's just say, and you realize that the women are sitting closer to the board. The average distance for the women is closer. Well, uh, we could say, let's control for seating arrangement. And so if you randomize, now the average distance from the board is the same for males and females. If you retest, then you, you see uh, you've controlled for seating arrangement. And if the gap closes, then you say that was it, right? And so uh, imagine randomizing on SES or comparing kids across racial groups who are similarly situated with regards to socioeconomic factors. The gap is still there. It exists. Uh, it's only a third smaller. So in other words, there's a gap in Ann Arbor and Shaker Heights, Ohio, in Prince George County, Maryland. These are affluent school districts, and they still have an achievement gap. Another one is bias and testing. This one I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, then there's uh, that schools perpetuate inequality. Essentially, they um, um, tend to, you know, raise kids to occupy the spaces in society from which they originate. And then finally, there's a cultural deficiency narrative. And so we've all heard some variation of this. This is the one that my research tends to focus on. This is, you know, uh, you know, back is they, they just don't want to learn. You know, Latinos don't want to learn. And so this is this opposition of culture. They're afraid that if they do well in school, they're going to be accused of acting white. So, so this is that explanation. And there are a lot of other explanations, but these are just some. Uh, I am convinced that it's not the culture explanation. I've done, uh, I've conducted uh, several studies on this. I've written a book on the topic, and I've uh, looked at six different data sets, two from the UK, uh, and I've tried to find evidence for this framework, and I do not find support for it in the US or the UK. Um, so I'm fairly convinced that it's not this. Uh, and I just uh, published a book this month 
on a parental involvement in which you know, I was trying to test whether or not, one of the things that you know, one can look at is if uh, the achievement gap stems from the fact that black and Latino parents are less involved. And I don't find support for that. So I'm not convinced. So where should we focus our attention? OK, so here's the answer. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So testing bias is one. Early schooling is another. Lack of a real dialogue on race and lack of understanding for structure. Okay. So I want everyone to take a second and read this question. The actress bearing on stage seemed blank. Her movements were natural and her technique blank. The answer is C. But I want people by show of hands to, to, to show, do you think this question is racially biased? If you do, show of hands. Way up high. Okay. Obviously, you know the answer is yes. It is racially biased. Uh, but it's not biased in the way most people think it is. Most people are going to say, well, it's biased because uh, lived experience, you know, black people don't have this lived experience, Latinos don't have this lived experience, and so therefore they're not familiar with the theater. Or ex you know, we've all heard some variation of that narrative. Uh, that's not why it's biased. Uh, it's actually biased against whites. This question is biased against whites. A greater share of black students answer, correctly this, uh, answer this question correctly than whites. And so it's, it's biased against whites. Um, when you are uh, in, in, in the ETS, Educational Testing Service, when they construct their exams, uh, there's a roster of questions that are on the SAT or uh, LSAT or whatever exams that they, that they create. There's a roster of questions. And anytime they uh, put new questions on the exam, they never introduce an entirely new exam. That's too risky because we believe that these questions have been vetted and they're measuring what we believe they're supposed to be measuring. Therefore, when you, when you introduce new questions, you have to do it uh, slowly, one at a time. And so every test contains some test items that don't count toward the total. Uh, and at the end of the test, when everyone takes a test, you then determine whether or not that test item is good enough to be part of a roster. And so the only way you can determine how the, how the question performed is you have to see how it performs relative to the other questions in the roster. So keep that in mind. Basics of ETS construction. Each individual SAT question ETS chooses is required to parallel the outcomes of the test overall. So if high scoring test takers more likely to be white tend to answer the question correctly in pre-testing, it's a worthy SAT question. If not, it's thrown out. Race and ethnicity are not considered explicitly, but racially disparate scores drive question selection, which in turn reproduces racially disparate test results in an internally reinforcing cycle. Item selection is not random. This is not a quirk of any one particular SAT test. SATs are designed to be very strongly correlated with one another. I don't believe the ETS intended for the SAT to be a white preference test. However, the scientific test construction method the company uses leads to this result. The actor's bearing question that you just read looks like a typical SAT verbal question, yet the question differs from others in one important respect. According to ETS, 8% more African Americans than whites answered the question correctly. So it's a black preference question. Nearly all SAT questions capture something about race that can't be determined until pre-testing. Because it favored blacks who scored lower on the test overall, this question, which was pre-tested in 98, did not favor high scores and therefore was rejected for use on the SAT. There are several questions uh, that are black preference, uh, black preference SAT math questions that are also rejected. So is it fair? On October 98, every single one of the questions on the uh, SAT favored whites over blacks. Latino test takers are similarly affected, faring only better than blacks. The same pattern holds for the LSAT and other popular tests. So the thing I say is that if you are um, black and you did poorly on the SAT, don't worry about it. It was rigged. <laughs> it was rigged. Uh, if you're white and you did really well on the SAT, don't get too happy. It was rigged. <laughs> this is how this pattern makes sense. Now this pattern makes sense to me. If I construct a test and I have 100 items, and I give it to everyone in this room, and I only select the items for which females score correctly, uh, a greater share of females score correctly, and I only select those items, I'm going to have a gender gap. And that gap is going to be persistent. Because I'm only choosing the questions that a greater share of females score correctly. And that's how these patterns make sense. That's why they're so consistent. They're so persistent. 
So that's one thing. That's bias and testing. The second thing, uh, the second place where we need to focus is on uh, early schooling. So here I'm showing you achievement in the fall of kindergarten. This is based on data from Fryer and Levitt. Uh, what I did was I uh, plotted their findings. I just made a, a visual image of their findings. And so this is fall of kindergarten, blacks, uh, Asian Americans, whites. White to the average. So I'm just showing you if, if whites are 20, uh, scored a 20 on average and Asians were a 22, I'm showing you the plus two. Okay? So here is the same information after you control for uh, social class, social background factors listed below. So here's the gap after you control for social class in the fall of kindergarten. And keeping those factors controlled moving across time, that's what happens to the gap. So essentially, if you compare blacks and whites who are similarly situated with regard to these factors of social class, uh, blacks actually do better than whites in fall of kindergarten in reading. That's reading and that's math. And so blacks and whites are most similar to one another academically when they walk into the school system. Here is data based on the CDS, Child Development Supplement of the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. And it's not panel, but what I'm showing you is that the gap for uh, first graders, second graders, this is how much worse blacks are doing relative to whites, reading and math, Woodcock Johnson. Uh, and you see that the gap widens and it kind of settles down somewhere around middle school. But they're most similar here. So here I'm showing you two kids, a white kid and a black kid. And they're growing, so the y, so this is years, this axis, this is knowledge. Make no assumptions about the gap here. Uh, here they're entering the school system, and this is what happens. And this is what actually should happen. Because they're most similar when they come in here. And it's after they come in here that you start to see a divergence. So the final thing that I, the final place where I think we need to focus, so that, that was uh, bias and testing, uh, that was early schooling. The other thing is understanding uh, probability and distribution, and that's something that we don't understand, and this is important for educators, is that here's an example that I give in order to bring across a sociological imagination. Say you have 80 red students and 80 blue students, and the red students took a test prep course. Well, I'm putting uh, test scores down here. So this is one blue kid. So each dot represents one person. So here you have 80 red students and 80 blue students. Each group is going to have this, that's the average for everyone, but each group is going to have its own distribution. Okay? Uh, and so what you see here is that not everyone who took the test passed, and not everyone who did not failed. Okay? So these are the personal problems, and this is a success story. Uh, this morning, I actually learned from Kerwin the, the phrase, uh, uh, um, guy who. Guy who, and that'll become uh, obvious now in a second. So examples I like to use this for is, let's say if you took all these people and randomly sorted them into uh, Hawaii and Kansas and come back 10 years later, in which place do you think you're going to have a high proportion of swimmers? <laughs> so let's pretend that this is score on a swimming exam. And these are the people uh, sorted into Hawaii, and these are the people sorted into Kansas. Well, not everyone in Hawaii can swim, and not everyone in Kansas can't. This is the guy who. This is the person who says, it's not true that if you come from Kansas, you can't swim, because I know a guy who <laughs> swims like a fish, and he's from Kansas. And then somebody says, I know another guy who you know, is from Kansas and can't swim at all. And so the point is, this becomes that charter school that's working. And we want to build policy around guy who. And that's not understanding the notion of distribution and where in the distribution are we looking. This data point that we're looking at, where in the distribution does it sit? And I think that that's something that we need to learn more about. Uh, this is another little example I like. I, I have one minute left, but I want to kind of go through this. So this is a fluent villa hood town. So here you have nice cars, and you have some potholes. And this person didn't make it, but these people made it. Here, it's not quite the same. These people can look at them and say, hey, we made it to the end. We have fewer car repair bills. We're better drivers than you. What's wrong with you guys? Right? And that's often uh, uh, not understanding the distribution that they belong to. That this person here is not the same as them. Because look at all they had to go through to get to where they are. And so it's lack of understanding of proportions and distributions. And then the final thing is that, and I'll get to the, the, the punchline, is that we don't know how to talk about race in this country. 
Uh, and if we're going to talk about the achievement gap and how to solve a racial problem, we have to be comfortable talking about race. And that's not something that we do very well. Um, and so there's, there are studies that show that teachers, uh, one study, I'll just briefly summarize one study in which uh, a black kid and a white kid were video recorded and they were told, look, today you guys are going to be white for the day. Y'all know what that means. They were white for the day. You know, they, you know, hi, Bob, hi, Bill. They were white for the day. Uh, and then the next day they were recorded and they were told to be black for the day. And you know what that means. They had swagger for the day. And these videos were shown to teachers, and teachers were asked to evaluate these students in terms of problem behaviors, the need for special education, and achievement. Guess which pair was, was rated worse on all three, just on the basis of the video. And so these are biases that people have. And it's a result of us not, ha not knowing how to talk about race. So this is my final slide. Um, I think that there's a, there's a dialogue among blacks about race. Each group has a dialogue about race. And so you know, if you go to the living room of black folk, you know, after dinner, and they get to talking, you're gonna hear some dialogue about race, right? Uh, and, you know, there are things that black folks say when white folks ain't around, right? Uh, white folks have a dialogue about race, but see, this is a segregated white school, and they have a dialogue. He ain't part of it. It's probably about him, but he's not, he's not a part of it. So he doesn't know what they're talking about, right? Um, and so what's in this dialogue? What do black folks say? Well, we say you can't trust white people. They wear shorts in the winter. They don't see their privilege. They stereotype us. They're racist in denial. These are the kind of things we say. Uh, what do white folks say when we're not around? This is what they say. I'm going to tell y'all. No, I don't know. I don't know. But the point is we have very little overlap. We have very little overlap in terms of the kinds of things we actually talk about. And so we have to be able to talk about um, race in a real way in this country before we can solve the achievement gap. Thank you. Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so again, I'm Stephanie Rowley, and uh, my primary appointment's in psychology, so as Robin and Brian asked me to think about how people in my field think about educational disparities, I was thinking primarily about uh, psychological approaches. And I guess when I was thinking about psychology, I was thinking about the stereotypic psychology, which is thinking about what happens in the brain, uh, though psychology is technically the study of behavior. Um, so first I just wanted to say thank you to Brian and to Robin and to Susan and to Bill for, uh, for having me today. Uh, on my way over, I got a, uh, I don't know, you got a Facebook post shout out from a good friend of mine from undergrad who was reminding me that 28 years ago, um, he and a bunch of my friends who were here as undergrads at Michigan back in the late 80s, I guess I might as well say it since it's been 28 years, <clears throat> uh, were the first to really fight for the celebration for uh, Martin Luther King's birthday. And so uh, what an honor to be here. Very exciting. So um, Brian and Robin again said, OK, what does your field say about educational disparities? So I started thinking about it. And what I realized is that psychologists say relatively little about educational disparities. That is, when you look at the literature in psychology, starting again in the late 80s, uh, coincidentally, uh, what you see is a lot of um, discussion about the nature of race comparative research. And one of the things that happened right here at Michigan, um, actually I was an undergrad at the time, uh, folks like Vonnie McLeod, who was one of my mentors, started studying uh, the way we look at race in psychology. And one of the things that came out of that body of work is that we do a really poor job of comparing people across race. And oftentimes, we don't equate people for socioeconomic status. And in fact, we're choosing low-income African Americans and middle-income whites and comparing them. And we're ending up with these deficit models of learning and development that are really uh, damaging to the low-income ethnic minority uh, children 
in particular. So this was primarily in developmental psychology, but not exclusively. And so there was this movement to move away from race comparative research. Not because there's something inherently bad about race comparative research, but because we were doing an inherently bad job of carrying out this research. So relatively few people are doing uh, what Angel was talking about in terms of comparing whites and blacks and finding those variables that explain disparities between them in psychology. But there are certainly a few, uh, few areas where people are doing some really nice race comparative work and demonstrating that issues around uh, discrimination, stereotyping, uh, classroom culture are all um, reasonable explanations of achievement gaps. I would say reasonable in that um, they're still not really explaining a lot of the variability. So there's clearly something going on um, that's beyond socioeconomic status, that's beyond uh, stereotyping. It's difficult to really gauge discrimination. I would say perhaps it's not so far beyond discrimination. Um, but I really uh, was taking, trying to take it as a uh, or think about it in terms of psychology proper. So the interesting thing, though, is if you pick up psychological journals and you read anything about African Americans or Latinos, the very first paragraph of those papers is going to say, blacks do less well in school than whites. Latinos do less well in school than whites. There is an achievement gap that has persisted over time. And yet, when you actually look at the research, what you find is that they're not race comparative at all that you're saying, oh, that racial identity predicts achievement for African Americans. Or maybe that uh, parent involvement predicts achievement for Latinos. So I think that one of the things that's happened in psychology in particular is that we have problematized African Americans and Latinos, and we begin every debate about blacks and Latinos from the perspective of this deficit or difference. So I've had uh, colleagues, actually, and others say to me, but how can you talk about black people without talking about the achievement gap? You can't talk about how well black students do in school without pointing out the fact that they're not doing well, right? And in fact, um, you know, this is the, the elephant in the room if you don't say that first and foremost. And I, I often um, struggle with my students because this is where they want to start. And to me, the real elephant in the room is why don't we talk about that Asian white gap that Angel had on those slides? Why are we not concerned about the poor performance of white students in the United States? And why is it then when we talk about achievement gaps, we start at low-income ethnic minority students? There could be lots of reasons for that. I don't know, but I think there's something in the way that we frame the achievement gap, even the very term, that begins at this place of, um, of deficit, of vulnerability, of pathology, etc. And I think that that then pervades the experiences of these students that we're talking about. So I'm really convinced that in many ways we're doing damage to the very students that we're trying to help by framing their very existence in terms of the way that they are less than, different from, etc. So I got really interested in this a couple years ago. So I was reading the Ann Arbor News back when there was an Ann Arbor News. And uh, there was a story there about the achievement gap in Ann Arbor. So, again, as Angel pointed out, there's a sizable achievement gap in Ann Arbor. And people say, but the schools are great. Um, and, I, you know, there's so many resources here, so many opportunities. I just don't understand it. Topic for a different day. Or maybe today. But, uh, but my point was, in reading the article, what I noticed is that the way they were talking about the achievement gap and the way that uh, the local schools were trying to address this was through addressing the children. That is, they were saying, well, we need to throw more money at them. We need more special programs. We need more tutoring. We need people from U of M to come in and sit with them. No offense against people who, from U of M who come in and sit with students, because I think it's great. But we problematize the child rather than the school. So who said, what can we do to the school context that would change things? And in fact, there are a number of achievement gap interventions that have been really successful in North Carolina, for instance. So one of my favorites is where the uh, school invited high-performing African-American students to visit, just visit, a gifted classroom uh, where they didn't have test scores that were high enough to actually get into gifted programs, but they were allowed to visit for a year. So at the end of the year, they retested these kids who were visiting. And lo and behold, their test scores were high enough for them to legitimately be in the class. 
Well, what happens? You put a kid in the classroom with the best teacher in the school, with the best students in the school, with the most rigorous curriculum in the school, and they flourish. But instead, what we often want to do is segregate these children in special education programs, in special tutoring, in special this, that, and the other, and we don't think about the larger context. And so my first point is really that we need to think about how, indeed, we are framing the problem of the achievement gap and where we locate the problem. So in one of my uh, own studies that came out of this, so I, uh, I wrote a small grant in response to my thinking about this, is I said, what do parents and kids think? So as a black parent, when I send my kid to school every day, am I thinking I'm sending him off to be part of the gap? Um, you know, kind of. And what happens to parents when they do that? And so what we did is we, we um, interviewed black and Latino parents and their kids, and we gave them this story about the achievement gap. Half of them read about the achievement gap. And then we asked the parents after reading the story to help their kids on like a math homework type task. And we, you know, we played it up. It's really difficult. Uh, and even the parents who weren't in the priming group were told that school is hard and the task is hard and things like that. And what we found in those parents who were, who were reminded of the achievement gap before they helped their kids was that these parents were more intrusive. So when they helped their kids with the task, they were more likely to take the task over for their child. We know that autonomy is really important for kids at this age. These were middle school kids. We found that they were more negative and anxious during the task and that they were less supportive of their kids. So our interpretation is that these, the framing of the achievement gap, the constant reminders in the minds of parents and teachers and kids are then leading parents to potentially maladaptive parenting. So you're not allowing your kids to explore things on their own because you're so nervous about uh, how they're going to perform. Uh, and of course, this is going to trickle down to the kids and how they feel about themselves. Obviously, we know that this is also affecting uh, teachers as well. So I think that this deficit approach also address, uh, uh, influences the kinds of questions that we undertake. Another one of my colleagues, John Hagen, did a study of the outlets, the top outlets for adolescent research in psychology. And he gathered all of the articles from these journals from a period of time. And what he found is that the studies of black and Latino youth were almost all pathology-based, saying what is wrong with black and Latino youth. The studies of white and Asian students, of, of uh, white and Asian youth, were primarily normative. So how does their life unfold over time? And so, of course, um, we're beginning to get to this point where a child comes into the classroom and the teacher can tell by looking at them that they are a problem because they are a part of a particular group. And we know from studies of, of uh, young teachers in particular that they're heavily swayed by these stereotypes. Again, as Angel pointed out, simply by looking at children, by hearing them speak, by looking at their clothing, their hairstyle, et cetera, they're making judgments about uh, who these children are and what they need to do to fix them. Right? So there are certain kids who need to be fixed when they walk in the classroom, which has serious implications for their uh, ability to move within that space. Um, so this brings me to my second thought, is that we need to move outside of the box of just thinking about uh, what's happening academically in the classroom and think about some non-academic things that are affecting children that down the line affect performance. Um, one of the big things that I've been thinking about a lot for the past several years is the school-to-prison pipeline and the fact that black and Latino youth are much more likely to end up uh, suspended and expelled from school. Uh, these rates of differences are gigantic, threefold, fourfold in some cases. And so what's happening is uh, the ACLU has put together a lot of really wonderful resources on the topic. And what's happening is a black child engages in uh, the same behavior as a white child, and the black child is more likely to be suspended or expelled. Um, the other thing is African American children are more likely to be suspended for uh, what I call soft offenses, things like being disrespectful to the teacher or disru disruptive to the class, whereas white students are more likely to be suspended or expelled for more concrete offenses like smoking or bringing uh, drugs to school, etc. So that means there's more question or more um, uh, subjectivity, I think, in, in line with what's happening with a lot of the African American students. So the psychological issue here is that what then happens to the student who is suspended? So you go home for like two weeks, 
Uh, my friend, my, my son had a friend who was suspended in the sixth grade for sending an inappropriate note to a girl. He was suspended for 14 days in the sixth grade, right? And no, he got 10 days. She got 14 because she initiated the contact. But the point is, for 14 days he sat at home. Where were his parents? They had to work. He's at home by himself for like 14 days. So do you think he got his homework? Uh, do you think that he was missing out on instruction? And then psychologically, what happens to him as he returns to school? So he comes back to school, and his friends are looking at him. This has disrupted his relationship with the teacher. It has disrupted his learning process. The whole class has moved on without him. They're on two units further. And he's ready to go to sleep. So he kind of checks out, or he engages in further misbehavior. And so I think this is a serious problem because, um, again, the disparity in disciplinary action is leading to disparities in achievement. Uh, one other kind of non-classroom issue that I wanted to raise as thinking again about psychologists is the issue of physical health and well-being. So we know that African American children in particular are lo losing many more days of school to illness. Um, and asthma is one of the biggest illnesses that is keeping African American children home. They're missing many more days of school due to asthma. Also obesity related illness and um, sleep related disorder. So lately I've been really interested in uh, the causes of stress and how they manifest in achievement and it's via these health related issues. So we know that asthma is exacerbated greatly by stress. Um, we also know that sleep is disrupted by stress, and that African American students are getting less sleep than pretty much anybody else, poorer quality sleep than anybody else, and we have found uh, recently in some of the work we're doing at the Center for the Study of Black Youth and Context here at Michigan, we're finding that this disordered sleep is then leading to um, difficulties, so lower persistence in the classroom, uh, lower engagement in the classroom, less preparation for school, you're less likely to do your homework, and of course you're sleepy all day, so it's um, <clears throat> uh, causing problems in social relationships and a whole host of other things. And so what, you know, I think with the adult literature on things like racial discrimination, what we're finding is that there's lots of connections to psychophysiology and these physical kinds of outcomes. We're thinking about this less, I think, in the lives of children and how these these uh, diseases are racialized in some way, at least in terms of the um, rates of that uh, African American kids in particular are experiencing them. <clears throat> so to conclude, uh, psychology does not tend to study educational disparities by and large. So we tend to study predictors of performance within African American, within Latino, uh, within other ethnic groups. However, we tend to still frame things in terms of educational disparities, but only for certain groups. So the disparities are only relevant at certain times. Although identity-related processes are probably most explained, so I didn't talk about the whole host of other things that predict uh, achievement for uh, students of color, there are so many things outside of the academic things that I think psychologists study, but we haven't brought to bear on this question of educational disparities uh, in race and ethnic related disparities. Although consideration of context is integral to psychological studies, so we do study context all the time, I also think that more should be done to fully explore the role of school resegregation, so what happens as schools are rapidly resegregating uh, around the country. In Michigan there's the Schools of Choice initiative that has really led to high concentrations of poverty, so this is where children can go to a, a neighboring school take their money with them and go to this other school because it's better academically or in whatever way. Um, and what it has left is a number of districts that are primarily minority in the state that are highly concentrated in terms of poverty. And so there's a question of how some uh, certain uh, contexts are working in tandem with race. And then also some of these um, policy. So one of the things that's interesting is Angel kept saying without intervention, but we're thinking of No Child Left Behind in, a, in effect as an intervention, and what we know is that the gap has closed almost not at all since 2003. And so, um, you know, we have to think about how these uh, interventions are also causing uh, unexpected negative consequences, things like high rates of instability among these schools where uh, principals are leaving or having to leave as part of restructuring, whole 
uh, teaching staffs are being fired and these children's base of support is being eroded uh, because someone said you have to do something radical because things are not working out. Um, other things, school start times, access to health insurance, I think are a number of different policies that are directly affecting these issues. So, thank you. I look forward to your questions. So thank you very much for having, having me. I'm very happy to be back, back home, as I was saying earlier today. Um, lots of the things I wanted to touch upon have already been mentioned by my other panelists. In particular, the fact that the racial achievement gap is massive is very well known to you. So what I'm going to do for the first few minutes of my talk is, in fact, for the entire talk, is I'm going to speak both about achievement, as has been described thus far, and attainment years of completed schooling, etc. So when I say attainment, I'm going to mean both things. So when you look at the data, the striking thing to the social scientists is that the gap, however measured, achievement, GPA or whatever thing, or uh, propensity to graduate high school, these are big gaps, as has been said. They're big, they appear to be durable, and we observe them irrespective of the measure we look at. Precisely why that should be is very puzzling. Okay? I think something we have not talked about today, and something I've been hearing about more and more, is the possibility that the gaps might differ by gender among blacks. Okay? Which, if true, I don't know this to be true, but I've been hearing about these papers. Brian will certainly know. That if that is true, that's a deeply tantalizing result. Like, why should it be the case that girls should be faring better than boys on some tests if their environments are almost exactly identical. I say almost exactly because a brother and sister do not live in precisely the same environment. Parents interact with them differently, thus and so, but access to various resources are roughly similar. Okay. Leaving that point aside, um, the thing is big. It's not clear exactly why it's so big, and it's not obvious what to do about it. And so I will spend 10 minutes or so talking about three questions. One is uh, what accounts for the gap? The okay. second question is, why should we care that the gaps are as huge as they are? And finally, how might we fix them? Okay. And so I'm going to begin with the middle one. Why should we care about the fact that the racial attainment slash achievement gap is big? From the, economist of a perspective, from the perspective of an economist, um, I think about consequences of these gaps manifesting themselves chiefly in the labor market. Okay? So when I look out at the world, most people receive their material well-being from their earnings. Okay? And so I say, if I look at people's earnings, I observe dramatic differences by race. Okay? Blacks earn way less than whites on average. Latinos are in between. Good. Now, what accounts for that adult material well-being differential? One striking thing we see in lots of research is that Education, attainment or achievement, explains the overwhelming bulk of it. Yeah? Indeed, there's a very well-known paper by my colleague at Chicago, Derek Neal, in which he argues that you can explain the entirety of the black-white earnings differential just conditioning on schooling. Yeah? Some of those results have been called, not called into question in terms of the quality of the research conducted, but looking at things slightly differently. It appears that the overwhelming majority of the gap can be explained, some believe, by schooling attainment differences. And so to the extent that we care about people's consumption or well-being or access to resources over the course of their lifetime, the fact that education explains much of it is one reason we should care. Yes? The second reason we should care is that if you turn your gaze away from earnings and you focus on things like incarceration probability, or you look at things like marital durability. Yeah? Whatever you look at, it turns out that being more educated, I've not mentioned race in this part of the conversation, that higher levels of education act as a kind of insurance against these negative outcomes. And so for all these reasons, the fact that in terms of earnings, in fact of outcomes like the ones I've mentioned, incarceration, marriage, whatever, 
that schooling so careful, so sharply protects you from bad outcomes is one reason we should, uh, yet another reason we should care. There's a third reason, I think, a third set of reasons. I don't know how exactly to frame this. I think that one of the really dangerous things about durable gaps in attainment is that even if the explanatory power of education for earnings or incarceration were zero, let's think for a second. Imagine it were the case that education differences played no role in my earnings later in life and did not, in fact, affect whether I went to prison or not. Yeah? Education and the exposure to education in childhood is something we all share. Yeah? The fact that there are durable differences by race, in my view, causes people to question the otherness, the otherness of blacks in particular. Yeah? That what is, what is it with these people, kind of like that? And they don't say that exactly. But when I see a pattern that says the 12th grade African Americans on average have four years less schooling than whites, yeah, there are people who would see that result, many millions of people, and say, I told you about them people. They might not even say that, but think it, which is even more dangerous. And when you think or are convinced about the otherness of a kind of person, then bad outcomes that afflict that person or that type of person do not strike you as anomalous and worthy of intervention. Yeah? And so we should be concerned about the gaps for at least these three reasons, in my view. As has been said, I'm an economist. And so the economist turns his attention to say we should care about these things. What explains them? How do they come to be? Okay? And so in economics, we use a particular prism to examine the education decision. Remember, I said I will be using attainment to mean both achievement and, say, the completion of a given level of schooling. Economists tend to regard education as principally the result of an investment decision. The logic here is that some agent, you yourself if you're an adult, or someone acting on your behalf if you're a child, causes this agent, decides to get more schooling so as to receive greater returns in the future. Yeah? Now, this investment occurs at a cost. And so education has built in within it this necessary dynamic thing. You see, where I'm incurring the cost today, or my child is incurring the cost today, and the benefits to her are being received somewhere in the future, maybe in the distant future. Okay. And so why might we suppose there to be systematic differences by race in the cost of attainment, yes? So one possibility might have to do with, um, I'm not sure, this is me speculating here, <laughs> might have to do with the, the support that families can provide. That's one possibility. And so education is acquired at a certain psychic cost. If I have in fact had calculus, I can instruct my child in calculus, thus and so. Families that have not been so privileged can't do it. That's kind of one thing. And so perhaps it's material disadvantage, contemporary disadvantage, faced by the child herself or her parent that prevents attainment levels from being equal. Yeah. Yeah. Another possibility has to do with expected future returns. And so one of the things I think we have done too little of in economics is to link the education decision, the decision to invest today for payoffs received tomorrow, to phenomena that go on in the labor market. Might it be the case, I wonder, that African-American parents or African-American young adults contemplating the college enrollment choice ask themselves a question like this. I go to college, to this wonderful university like Michigan, and I major in whatever thing, and let there be some likelihood of labor market discrimination when I'm age 25 or 30, of some amount, yeah? might that at the margin affect my decision, might in particular cause me not to go relative to my equally talented peer? Might a parent, a parent having that kind of belief, not nudge her child as far along as she could, as she should, perhaps, because of precisely this kind of concern? Yeah? And so there are reasons to suppose that features of the labor market and the way the labor market has historically rewarded families and families' expectations about 
likely future rewards might systematically affect the propensity of people who differ by race to achieve different levels, let's say, le given levels of school. So that's a human capital view. There are other features of human capital I want to briefly touch upon. Notice that when we talk about um, expected future returns, the investor, or the investor's agent, which is to say, Kerwin acting on behalf of his child, the investor's agent has to form this expectation of what earnings will be in the future. See? Discrimination, expected future discrimination, might enter into my, my belief about my child's future earnings. Yeah? But more generally, maybe I'm told by the psychological literature, there's something about systematic subjective belief differences by race, the source of which I do not know. But if there are, in fact, systematic subjective probabilistic differences, say blacks are more pessimistic about the country, for whatever rational reason, it might well be that even the absence of discrimination, their belief that investment today pays off positively down the line might be smaller than is true for whites. I've mentioned things here that economists don't necessarily focus on so much, but I thought I'd mention them. One set of things we do focus on a lot have to do with the educational production function. By the educational production function here, I mean the mechanism by which inputs, bringing your kid to school, depositing him or her, how that's translated into an educated kid down the line. Yeah? If you think about the educational production function, it has various inputs. One is the teachers, yes? Another is a textbook. A third is the unions, a four, thus and so. Now, for that to be a key explanatory, for it to be the principal source of the difference by race, one of two things has got to be true, it seems to me. It has either got to be true that African Americans and Latinos confront an educational production function fundamentally different from that of whites. Yes? Now, the more integrated the society is, yes? the less likely that is to be true. But it turns out that the society is becoming more and more resegregated. So it turned this argument, the possibility that the nature of educational production itself differs systematically by race, is something that must be seriously contemplated. Notice that even if educational production is exactly the same, its effects might differ by race. And so one of my friends told me that he sends his kid to a school in Chicago, where we both live, that's uh, a charter school. And, um, and it's a discipline-focused charter school. Yeah? And so I'm, I cast most Persian on the school. I'm just, this is the thing. And so you go in in the morning, and everybody has to stand against the wall that way. Yeah? And then you have to raise your hand to do that, and then you kind of like that. I thought about this and I thought, this would be terrible for my son. It would be terrible for him. The interaction of his kind of his endowments and rules, much to my dismay, is not good. <laughs> and so uh, you can imagine putatively race-neutral education production that nonetheless have hugely different racial effects for reasons of history and the rest. I'll take some, you know, I'll, put, I'll leave this aside, some other points about educational production for the question and answer period. I want to make sure I spend a few minutes talking about fixes. What might we do about it? It's a tricky thing. I'm always very nervous about solutions because lots of our contemporary problems were someone's solution the other day. You see? Very nervous about that. Well, let's think about this, this one. It seems to me that we can think of the schooling attainment, let's split schooling into junior and senior. Where by junior here I mean someone for whom the educational investment decision is made on their behalf by an altruistic parent or guardian or somebody. And on the other side, think of it as adult decision. Where a child is deciding whether to study her physics homework or to write the essay or kind of like that. Okay? Now, one of the really interesting things to me about um, the junior investment decision, is that lots of the policies I've seen proposed um, might not have the effect we intend. For if you reflect on it briefly, predictable reasons. Let me give one example. One example I have in mind is the role of teachers in education production. And so economists in general, and labor economists in particular, have spent lots of time over the last decade or so coming up with very convincing causal estimates, we call them, 
about the effect of teacher quality on what everything. Yeah? And let's suppose it's done perfectly. It's an RD. People in the Harris, the Ford School knows what, know what that means, right? It's clean, it's beautiful. And so better teachers, based on their score on some test, translate into a 7% increase in what everything. It's less than a degree. That's true. Good. And so you're a mayor of a city. You're a mayor of a city. And someone brings you this excellent result and report. In fact, it's 12%, not 7, 12%. And he says, what do we have to do? We have to improve the teachers in these schools, the quality of the teachers. And you hire a new secretary of education, say, to get that process initiated. And she fires teachers, because lots of them have not scored well, thus and so. You might imagine that black parents, curiously, would end up opposing that very initiative. And why might they do that? They won't oppose the initiative because they do not care about the educational attainment of their children. Instead, it might be the case that the people fired under this policy represent what currently constitutes the black middle class. And so if you think about the people terminated in Washington, D.C. under Michelle Ray, all of them are African-American middle class teachers. And so you say, on the one hand, if I improve the quality of the schools or the teachers, children's outcomes would improve. But the parents and the children themselves know that the people at church, their aunt, everyone, they, not everyone they know, many of the people they know have lost their jobs under this scheme. They will oppose the policy for the very rational reason that the policy has a spillover effect that's inimical to its stated goal. Yeah? That's one possible. A second implementation issue I want to mention in my remaining time has to do with the higher level of education. Folks like people in this room. What we've not talked about much is the fact that um, at selective schools, Berkeley and Michigan and Princeton and Yale and so forth, the share of students who are African American and Latino keeps falling. Yeah? That's another achievement gap. Yeah? It's not just the eighth grade. What about that? How do we fix that? It turns out that fixing that raises all kinds of complicated questions about fairness and justice. And, yes? And so my bottom line here is that whatever remedy we propose, whatever remedy we propose, will require the enthusiastic buy-in, not only of the putative beneficiaries of the policy, like the black parents in Washington, DC, but of the broader community. Because in the absence of that buy-in, there will be no program I can think of that will close these differences. Sorry, I'm not such a pessimist. pessimist no. And the second thing I want to say is that whereas economics has brought lots of sharp insights to these questions, many of the things I've mentioned are not within the purview of economics. We can't answer them at all or answer them well. And so whatever answer is ultimately devised will be an answer that draws from the expertise of people in political science, in psychology, in sociology, and that's uh, a plea to my economist colleagues. Thanks. So we have, of course, more questions than we're ever going to have time for, but so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, so a uh, question for Angel. We had a couple of these, so I'll kill two birds with one stone. So uh, a couple questions about what would a real dialogue uh, between races look like, and do you have any suggestions for how to facilitate that or encourage it? <coughs> yeah, well, um, I think that um, a real dialogue is one in which um, uh, white folks say what they want to say, uh, and um, black folks don't become angry with them. And so, for example, um, one of the things that happens oftentimes is that there are thoughts that you know, many people's grandparents might have where you, you cringe. You say, oh, I hope my friends don't know that my grandmother feels this way. You know, you cringe. And a lot of us may have these views, um, but uh, for a lot of, if I'm, if I'm a white person, I'm going to be careful about what I say because I don't want that black person sitting in class looking at me like, say something, say something. You know how it is. And so the last thing you want to do is be labeled as racist for a genuine question that you have um, that's real, right? Because we, we, and so we have to be able to have a, a, a dialogue where both groups feel comfortable. And you have to appreciate that whatever someone says, you have to say, OK, given their lived experience, this view makes sense to them. The, the question then becomes, how do I present alternative pieces of data 
that um, helps them see a different view or a different side. Because we're all racist to some degree. I'll give you one quick example. Um, I remember I was at Princeton, and I heard a girl uh, shouting across campus to get someone else's attention. And I heard, Sarah, and I turned around, and I, thought, and I said, oh, thank goodness she's white. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because if she was black, I would cringe, because it doesn't look the same. It looks worse. This is why the same behavioral infraction for black and white kids, the black is punished more harshly. And when you look at blacks and whites, just think about it. See a bunch of white kids outside skateboarding? See a bunch of black kids? It doesn't look the same. So when I hear some kids in the library making noise, I always hope that they're white, mm -hmm. right? Because they can sustain that to their image. But for black folks, I cringe. I'm like, oh, God, because of what it's going to, how it's going to be perceived by the other. And so we have to be able to be comfortable talking about these things because teachers see this and they're making assessments on the, what's the same, but it's really not the same. Uh, another question that was, uh, came up a few times in the, uh, from the audience had to do with the gender differences. And so there was alluded to before, there certainly is the gender differences among whites, but the gender differences favoring girls is even large among African Americans. Um, you know, what can this tell us about potential explanations and potential solutions uh, to attainment um, among African Americans? So I, I mentioned gender differences, and I, I think that um, what I tried to say, but didn't come across clearly perhaps, is I, I, we know, let's imagine a brother and sister in the same household. It is the easy thing, the casual thing, the careless thing, to say that they have exactly the same environment. Um, let's imagine that African American children are disproportionately likely to, relative to, to live in single mother households. My colleague Dan Black and I have done this very simple thing in LSY. We examined that single mother's knowledge. The LSY has this question about parental familiarity with the teenage child's friends. Yeah? The mother knows a lot about the girl's friend like when she, who she's going out with, what she's doing, this and so, and knows way less about her teenage son. I make no causal claim, don't leave and say Kerwin said. So. <laughs> That's interesting to me. And there's a kind of logic, internal logic, you know? Like I can, I can imagine a mother saying, I, what do I know from being a teenage boy? Um, I think this is an area demanding more investigation, but at a minimum, it suggests that coarse, kind of unsubtle arguments about the nature of material deprivation on outcomes need to be modified and sharpened if outcomes are that different by gender. And they are different. Yeah. I also think it depends on the differences you're looking at. So there are a lot of um, basic um, you know, grades in elementary school and middle school, for instance. The gap between white girls and boys and black girls and boys are quite similar. Um, attainment, certainly, there are large differences, right? So who's going to college? Um, there are larger differences as you move through high school in terms of course taking and things like that. But I think that, you know, I think there's also this tendency to, um, to distort some of the differences and assume that there's this double jeopardy for black boys, wherein black boys are doing, you know, uh, exponentially worse than black than black girls or white boys in school, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, I think in psychology, there have been some similar kinds of models where uh, it's been found that uh, among African American parents, well, no, among parents, mothers tend to have higher expectations for their daughters and to put more demands on their daughters for maturity, and fathers tend to do the same for sons. So fathers have higher expectations for sons and put more uh, have greater demands on them. And the issue then, as it relates to socioeconomic status, is that low-income African-American parents are, or families are likely to be uh, headed by single women. And so if you're a son, you get the, um, the sort of uh, warmth and support of the mother, but not necessarily the high expectations of the father. Um, also don't want to assume that just because a father's not residential that he's not involved, but certainly there seems to be some suggestion that that's one of the, the, the reasons for some of those disparities. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, uh, we're, we're, we all navigate different spaces. And so there was a, 
There was a movie by uh, uh, Shallow Hal, which was a movie with Jack Black, in which he fell in love with, uh, he, a spell was put on him and he was supposed to fall in love with people's, uh, 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 see people's inner beauty. And if someone was, uh, so he fell in love with the woman who he saw as Gwyneth Paltrow, but the world saw as a woman in a fat suit. But it was a very well done fat suit, so it wasn't like Eddie Murphy the Clumps. You know, it looked like a real person. So he sees, uh, he falls in love with, with her, and during the making of the movie, I saw Gwyneth Paltrow being interviewed in the fat suit. And she says, you know, it takes hours to put this on and take it off, so we get takes, as many takes as we can. So in between takes, she's walking through the lobby of the hotel, and she says, you know, uh, the stares that I, that I received, she said, for the first time, I know what it's like to live life in a body like this. An obese person will look at her and say, oh, yeah, that's my life. That's every day for me. You right? All of us are navigating the world, and the world's interacting with us in different ways. Right? And so as a, as, a, as a white woman, there are things that you pick up about the world uh, and things that you can access that I can't. Right? And so just think about this. The amount of distance that we have to cover in social interactions, even in spaces like this, the amount of distance, you know, we all have a switch we have to be on. The amount of distance that white people, white males have to, have to when they turn the switch on, it's not as much distance as a black person in this space. You know, here we're on, we're formal, and then when we go home, it's, what's up, man? You know, you, you know it's, it's a big distance you have to cover. And then if you're black, you add to that distance the whole male, you know, criminal, thug, jail. You had all those stereotypes. And so just imagine that the world is kind of um, perceiving black males in a particular way, uh, the worst of all the groups. Uh, and they have to navigate that in schools as children. Teachers are kind of, you know, I'm going to fix you. You know, teachers are projecting these negative stereotypes on them, even black teachers themselves especially, because their thing is, I'm going to fix you so you won't shame us when you get out there. You see what I'm saying? And so you're always communicating that there's something wrong with your blackness or your black maleness. You have to be fixed. Uh, and so I think that that plays a role as well. Um, so there's a question here about the role that federal policy plays in all of this. And I'm going to expand it a little bit to say more generally, since we're at a policy school, what, what role can policy play in this? Is it always a negative role, which some of you highlighted, in, or can it be a positive role? And I, I um, look. I so I'm, suppose suppose we didn't measure by race. So suppose we didn't measure by race at all. What would be different about the world? Suppose we didn't know, right, that NAEP scores in Alabama or whatever are X percent smaller for black children, and we weren't walking around with that in our heads. I actually don't have an answer to this question. I'm just saying, it's interesting to think about. Right? Suppose we didn't know that um, incarceration rates were winning. Um, that's clear federal policy. And I think we never question things that we have inherited from history. There's no reason, it seems to me, to collect data carefully by race. We don't collect data by height. Um, and if we believe it to be an in equally uninteresting datum, which I do not believe, but work with me, um, then why not add it to that? Um, testing is interesting. Maybe make tests lower stakes, perhaps. Um, I think it's good that we know how children are faring. Um, <coughs> and I think it is peculiar that the state, the country varies so widely based on the accent of where a child happened to be born in what is expected of her that she be taught or that she know in high school or middle school for that matter. Um, I know this is a very controversial thing, and its particular implementation under this and the previous president make it even more so, but um, I like that policy approach. And the third one is, it seems to me that our efforts to narrow racial differences in schooling and other things, if applied too late, are almost doomed to fail. Um, that my own conjecture is that by senior year of high school, it's too late. I don't, I'm not an education expert, that's my guess. Kid six, spend, do, you know, so tilt federal dollars away from higher ed and tertiary ed towards um, primary school and maybe even before. Again, I say all this without any, there's no regression, there's no. <laughs> there are regressions. Somebody there, ran there some. Yeah, yes, that's just what I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say, uh, 
I, I think we need more creativity. And so clearly what we're doing now is not working. Uh, and there are some people who say they have the answer, some school, some charter school here, some charter school there. But clearly overall, it's, it, whatever we're doing, it's not working. So what we need is we need to, uh, uh, anytime you see an intervention, it's usually an incremental change. So they're taking the, the basic model of what we have now and they're just adding this. Let's add a little more dollars. Let's add, let's, let's increase teacher training here. And so it's incremental changes and then we wonder why it's not working because it's the same fundamental model. What I'm saying is perhaps we need an entirely different model of knowledge delivery. I don't know what it looks like, but if you told me, hey, change basketball, I'm saying, okay, I'm putting three goals on the court and two balls. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that game looks like, but if you force me to come up with a set of rules to accommodate that structure, that's a different game. And I'm saying that that's what we need with education. We need an entirely different game. Maybe we can have multiple models, you know? Uh, you, know the, you over here try this model, you guys over here try this model, and you know, let's see what happens. Because right now what we're doing is not working. So let's try different models. We have to get creative. And so this is, again, with no data, this is all from the gut. As an empiricist, I should be uncomfortable talking like this. But given that nothing is working, I think that you know, we need to take more risks and just be more creative and be open to completely drastic models of, just of educational delivery. I think we just have one more question because of the time. Um, and this is something that a few people have mentioned. There's uh, the role of, kind of what economists sometimes call as non-cognitive skills, motivation, grit, determination, <coughs> you know, other things has been, you know, received a lot of attention in, certainly in social science literature recently. What, um, what can we learn from the three disciplines about ways in which these type of non-cognitive abilities uh, you know, could be used to improve the, uh, the outcomes of low-income and African-American children? One of the psychologists will first. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there are, uh, so psychologists <coughs> also think about the non cognitive factors that are involved in education. Um, and I, I really think a lot of what happens in the schooling of African American kids, in particular Latino kids, low income kids, and you know, thinking about this concept of, uh, of social distance and the meaning of that social distance, right? So if you're an immigrant from anywhere, there's a social distance because you're coming to a new country, but that that distance may mean something different in terms of how you uh, are being read by others and how, uh, and how you view yourself. And I think that, um, you know, I wouldn't want to come down to a certain set of variables, but I think that a lot of the uh, disruptions at school come from the, um, the perceived distance, the perceived otherness of, um, of the kids. And so I think the, the interventions that I think really work either make those factors unimportant. So that is, if you figure that uh, parent involvement is the problem and disparities invo in involvement are the problem, then you set up a system wherein either you can get all the parents involved or you make parent involvement unimportant. So I think, um, you know, thinking about some of the charter schools, you know, the KIPP academies or wherever that, that are, are working in some ways, um, I think they've been able to overcome the social distance expectations and um, provide high quality social relationships. But I think it's a model that's difficult to spread. I was going to say, you know, maybe it's just me, but people who persist and stick to itness, they usually do it at things that they're good at. I don't know too many people that persist at things they're not good at. You know, it's, it's you know, usually they give it up at a certain point. And so, um, Perhaps what, what needs to happen is that students, particularly low achieving students, need to have more victories um, along the process uh, because that keeps you persisting. It's, it's, it's when you realize that you have a chance to be good at something that you continue to persist. That's why you enjoy basketball because you think you're going pro um, and that's why you give up on golf because you realize I'm not good at this. And so I think that um, to, to, to have a system where you have uh, a series of victories in there uh, real victories, you have to have real victories where, where you, know, you teach them something and, and point out the victories and not always point out the failures. Um, I think that that's really important because I, it's, I don't know people who persist at things that they're bad at. Or, or, or they don't know, if they do persist, they don't, they don't know they're bad at it. So they continue cooking, <laughs> they don't know they're bad at it. Yeah. And, you know.
I actually think that non-cognitive skills, that, that this is a really important area for us to think about going forward. Um, if you reflect on your own life and you think about people who you, you admire, people you think are very successful, who you want to grow up to be like, you know, there are people with grit. And by grit, I mean, you know, they can get up after punch, kind of like that. I don't know what the word is for that, but that's the thing. Can you get up after punch? Life's about punches. People are punching all the time. Um, and um, I am told that there exist racial differences in these gaps, but I, in these attainment, these non-cognitive measures. But I also am told that we have no sense whatsoever about how the gaps are produced, the, the, the skills are produced. It's not inconceivable to me that something about black material disadvantage could increase non-cognitive skills. You, you see what I'm saying? It's conceivable that women confronting an environment of gender discrimination might become stronger as a result. I, I don't know that, whether that's true or false, but my point is we have to think more carefully about the production of non-cognitive skills, which we know too little about, before we start messing around with them. This leaves aside the point, the excellent point made here about the fact that people will only persist or tend to persist either when they're good or when they don't know how terrible they are. Um, <laughs> So thank you everybody for coming. I want to thank our panelists for really very thoughtful and thought-provoking comments. Um, there was a reception in the Great Hall, which you're all invited to attend, and you can interact with our panelists there. And uh, thank you all very much. <laughs>